Today we have a guest speaker from the Palmer and Food Protection Consortium. Uh, so Victor is a third year doctoral student and graduate research assistant in food science and technology at Iowa State University. Being supervised by Dr. Keith Vorst, he received the BS in chemical engineering from Federal University of Sao Carlos in Brazil in 2019, being a visiting scholar at the University of British Columbia for one year. He was also an R&D intern for one and a half years at 3M Brazil, working with processing and characterization of polymers including hollow glass microspheres. Uh, his doctoral research investigates the recycling of post-industrial and post-consumer plastic waste in projects funded by the DOE and the Food and Drug Administration. Uh, so we'll thank Victor for coming to talk. Thank you. So before starting on the plastics recycling itself, just some numbers that in, only in 2021, uh, North America, which means US, Canada and Mexico, 124 billion pounds of plastics were produced. And that number increased from 2020, even with the pandemic, 0.7%. And with all of that plastic that is being produced, we also have the plastic waste increasing. So when we increase the number of plastic being produced, we increase the number of uh, plastic waste. And a lot of that plastic waste is packaging. And packaging corresponds to 39%. That's the most updated number that I found. And the problem with packaging is that it has a very short lifetime. So less than a year, it will end up being plastic waste. And that plastic waste end up in a landfill, end up in an ocean or a river. But what we want is to recycle that plastic and find a new use for that. So we can do mechanical recycling, we can do chemical recycling, so there's a lot of options that we can do to avoid all of that plastic ending up in the landfill or even worse at the ocean. So here is some numbers from the US. This is from Waste Management. Waste Management is one of the largest companies uh, here in the US that works with waste. And out of the MSW is the municipal solid waste. 27% of the, the string can be recycled, and all of the 27%, 4.7 is plastic. So the other parts are metal, paper, cardboard, uh, glass. So and out of the 4.7% that are plastics that is being recycled, only, four, uh, only PET and HDP. PET and HDP, I'll, I'll go over that later, but those are the two types of plastics that have like an established mechanical recycling process. And all of the other plastics we call 3 to 7, I'll have a slide showing the differences of them. Uh, they are practically almost not recycled. So we see that there's a lot of uh, room to improve in terms of the recycling when we look at all the waste that's being generated here in the US. And here also some more numbers. And the first on the left here is just an estimate composition from 2020, um, all the curbside recycling. So when you have at your home, like those uh, bins for recycling, uh, this is an estimate of, of the materials that are being put for recycle. So not the trash, like the waste that is normal waste, but all the recycling waste that people use. And we can see there's a lot of paper, there's a lot of glass, a lot of cardboard, but there's a lot of other plastics that can be recycled. So PT, HDP, these two are mainly what's being recycled. Now what's, what's let's say, there's capability to be recycled, but there's a lot of other plastics. If you see 4.5%, they categorize as other plastic packaging. So that includes like polypropylene packages, um, film, so pouches, any uh, low density polyethylene, uh, anything that is film is in this category. And 3.1% bulk rigid plastics. It also includes some polypropylene like yogurt cups. Those are most of them are made of polypropylene. Uh, polystyrene cups, like these ones here, polystyrene. So they're currently not being recycled. And there's also includes here 1.4 of non-bottle PET. It, will, it can be like clamshell uh, packages, like for muffins in the bakery. So that's this 1.4%. So we see that there's a lot of materials that are not being recycled. And 
plastics is like 18.3% of the total of the materials that are being put into recycle. We're not considering all the plastic that is in the normal waste. So there's a lot of plastics out there. And this, I think, is the worst number that this is from the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. And here it shows how uh, of the generation of uh, waste or municipal solid waste, when you look at plastics, how much is being uh, generated out of the whole waste. So we see that from the 1960s, there's almost nothing of plastics. Plastics is recent, is, we can say it's a new product. So over the years, the number of plastics started to increase. And this is the most updated number, it's from 2018. But out of all the waste, when you consider organics and recycled, 12.2% are plastics. So a lot of, when you think of waste. And how much of that 12.2 is being recycled? 8.5%. So almost nothing. And we're seeing like numbers in thousands of tons. So 8.5, it's all of these tons. Imagine all of that plastics, 8.5 out of 12.2%. So almost nothing is being recycled here in the US. And there is a goal, the EPA and this uh, Biden administration, they have a goal to reach a 50% recycling rate here in the US. This recycling rate includes all paper, cardboard, metals, glass, and plastics, it's in the, the list. So there's a goal to increase this number and then there's a lot of steps that are required to, to get to that number higher. Here's just, I'm not gonna explain this, it's just to show if, if anyone is interested, the EPA has all of this data sorted by different categories, plastic types, like they divide by plastic containers, uh, other plastic packaging, then they divide durable goods, non-durable goods. So there's a lot of data available there that if anyone is interested, the EPA had released these reports with all of this data. Uh, since we're in Iowa, I thought it was interesting showing some numbers. So very similar to the national uh, composition, we have 18.3% of plastics in the waste in Iowa. And we see that like more a detail composition. One thing that, one number that I found it interesting is other plastic film, 7.8%. Plastic film is not being recycled. It's not recycled at all here in the United States because the infrastructure to recycle these plastic films is non-existent. There's one MRF here in the US that they did some studies, they converted, they, ex they spend a lot of money to change equipment to recycle plastic film. And plastic film is a problem because it entangles into the equipment, like a lot of rolls in the, in the MRF. Uh, conveyor, conveyor belts is also a problem with plastic films. So plastic films is the next challenge in terms of plastics recycling. So. And when you think of talking about recycling, 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 where all of this plastic goes once we set it to recycle and if they are put in the correct place to be recycled, they go to a MRF or a materials recovery facility. So these are pictures from Davenport. They, it's called the Scott Count Recycling Center. So this, this picture here is, is the tipping floor. That's where all of the trucks unload uh, the waste that they collect. So we see a lot of cardboard in there. Here is more at the end of the process. We can't see uh, well here, but more towards the end. It's just like here, I think it's the disc, disc screen is one of the steps during the recycling. And here, that's where they storage all of their bales. So after sorting all of the material, they bale these materials into, they have like a baler and they wrap around a uh, steel wire and they compact it. So there's like a, on the end there, I think is HDP colored and here close to the, to the front, I think was, I don't remember what it is, but I, I remember seeing they have like one pile of PET, one pile of HDP, 
color, one pile of HDP natural. HDP natural and color natural is mainly milk jugs. So in color is everything else, that, everything else of HDP that is rigid. So they don't put HDP film and there's a lot of HDP films in there. Uh, and then there is a three to seven plastic bale, but I'll touch that later, soon. And since we're talking about MRFs, uh, these, this map has the information of the top 20 MRF here in the US. So the largest one, these numbers are from uh, 2018, uh, is in New York. Uh, but there are some big MRFs also in Canada here. So, uh, and you see like, Biggest one is 247,000 uh, tons shipped. So a lot of plastic waste, big MRFs. It's way uh, larger MRFs compared to the one in Davenport here in Iowa. And this is a map that I made for a, a review paper that I worked. And this is just to, so we can have an idea where are all of these MRFs are located. So obviously uh, states with larger populations like California, Florida, uh, New York, Texas, they have more MRFs, more people. In Iowa, if I'm not mistaken, we have four MRFs. We have one in Davenport, one in Des Moines, one in Cedar Rapids, and they're building another one in Des Moines. That is four, I think. And we have one in Omaha, one in Lincoln, so there's some uh, bordering Iowa too. Uh, some states don't have MRFs, like for Alaska, it's a problem. They how they ship that all the material. Uh, North Dakota and Wyoming, like small population, so they couldn't. I think there's no market, there's no volume to, for a MRF. But Mississippi, uh, I don't know what they're doing with their waste, so they're not recycling much or they're shipping to another state. And now going over all of the research that uh, I'm doing here at Iowa State. Uh, this research is part of a project with the Department of Energy. It's called the Chemical Upcycling of Waste Plastics. So it's a, a collaboration with University of Wisconsin-Madison and University of Massachusetts. And here we, oh sorry, it's also part of uh, my group, the Polymer and Food Protection Consortium, that uh, I work with Dr. Vorst and Dr. Kurzweiler at Food Science. So we're all doing this research. And before I'm going to research, I decided to put this uh, identification codes here because I, I'm talking about number one, number two, uh, three to seven. So, and I'm going to use a lot of these uh, names here, but, and I don't know how much you're familiar with that. But what is being recycled, mechanical recycled here is PET and HDP, like I showed on those numbers before. All the other plastics, the MRFs, they put it together. They call three to seven plastic bales. In my uh, research, I took one of these three to seven plastic bales and I sorted everything. And I can say there's almost nothing of PVC. PVC is being phased out, let's say, because PVC, it's really challenging for mechanical recycling because once you put in an extruder, it can release uh, hydrochloric acid, so it's corrosive. You don't want that. You don't want that on your equipment. It's a safety hazard. So there's a lot of uh, companies that are moving away from PVC. It's a good plastic in terms of use. You can have find a lot of applications, but recycling is terrible of that. LDP it will be mostly film. But there's some LDP that is used for like leads, more soft applications where HDP could be a, a bit uh, too strong. You don't want a, such a strong plastic, you use LDP. Polypropylene, there's a lot of polypropylene on a three to seven plastic bale. Uh, a lot of yogurt cups, cottage cheese uh, uh, cups too. So a lot of packaging, food packaging is polypropylene. Polystyrene, like those party cups, uh, there's a lot of polystyrene out there. Some packagings like for household items, like those uh, mops that you use to clean the floor, those like blue ones, light blue ones, they're all made of polystyrene. 
And other includes everything that is multi-layer, like films that have like a layer of HDP and a layer of nylon. So those are considered number seven. A potato chip bag is also number seven because it has an aluminum layer in between. Uh, PLA is also number seven. So all the other plastics that don't match the one through six and are mixed, like two, two of these plastics are mixed, they're considered number seven. After we sorted all of the material, we ground all of these. We have some big grinders. So we got small flakes, like that one is uh, polypropylene. And I think now that's the part you're more, most interested in. We did the washing of all of this plastic. We didn't do of, all of that, but we took a part of that uh, sorted material after grinding and we washed. So the APR, the Association of Plastics Recyclers, they have some guidelines uh, on how to recycle. They, they call it, it's part of their design guidance tests. And there are some differences between HDP or PP flakes and for PET. So the main difference, and I'll go over the details, is the conditions of the washing for PT is a little bit more uh, stronger, let's say, than the HDP. Because PT has higher melt temperatures, it's a more, there are some considerations about that. And how we did, we put, we had those like, like a pan, and we added the, the water. I have the slides here, so. I think it's easier if I go for polyolefins, PE and PP. There are two options according to the guideline for an APR. One is a commercial basic wash, and option two is a caustic wash. For my material, because it was very dirty, I chose option two, caustic wash. The difference is uh, you add sodium hydroxide to the caustic wash, that's, that's the name. Uh, the commercial basic wash uses only the surfactant, it's a Triton X100 a brand name. But for both options, you add four, the amount of water that you use is four times the, the amount of plastics that you use. So if you're washing 500 grams of plastics, you add two liters of water. Uh, for those pans that I did, we were doing eight liters of water and two kilos of plastics. So for example, if you're doing two liters of water, 500 grams of uh, plastic flake, you add 0.3% of the mass of flake uh, in terms of surfactant. So it will be three grams, I think. Uh, tap water at room temperature. You stir at 10 minutes. Uh, there's like, we have an impeller. So you just stir for 10 minutes. They say around 200 240 meters per second, but that's approximate. There's a range that you can use. After you steer for 10 minutes, you're gonna see some like foam because it's uh, like a detergent, like soap. Uh, you wait for 10 minutes and then you skin, like you take a sieve and you collect everything that is floating because polyethylene, polypropylene density is lower than the water. So, and Everything that is at the bottom of the pan, you're gonna remove. You don't want it, that's trash. That might have some plastics that you're not interested. So for the option two, the difference is you add sodium hydroxide and you use 75 degrees Celsius, the water. And if you're planning to do at a high temperature, one thing that speeds up is heating the water at a microwave because we had our pan uh, under a st uh, steer plate with like heating. It takes a long time, especially if you're trying to heat it eight liters of water. So heating the water at the microwave helps a lot, speeds up the process. After the washing, we have the rings and the sink float process. The rings is just, you follow the same proportions for four times the amount of water to the amount of plastic. Room temperature, you steer only for five minutes, same agitation, you wait five minutes for to have the separation, then you skin again and have like your plastic and everything that is waste. 
Then you repeat again the sink flow. The sink float is very similar to the rinse, but you double the amount of water. So if you have eight liters of water for one kilo of plastic. Also tap water, room temperature, steer for five minutes, but you do it slower at this time, maximum, they say 500 RPM. I don't know why they didn't use the same RPM here. They say meters per second here, but that's the APR. And you wait five minutes and you skin, and then you have your plastic washed clean. You just put it in an oven to dry uh, at a temperature that's 60, 60 degrees or lower. You don't want to go higher than that, so to avoid any degradation. For PET, same proportion of water to plastics. You just, you increase the, you only have a hot wash. You don't have like two options of wash. You Instead of 0.5%, use 1% of sodium hydroxide, same 0.3% of surfactant. You, uh, the temperature of the water is 85 degrees now for 15 minutes, and you wait for 15 minutes instead of 10 for polyolefins. The rinse is warm water instead of room temperature, so you have to heat it up to 45 degrees Celsius, but it's five minutes and then it's skin. Sink float is room temperature, tap water, also double the amount of water, sear for five minutes, wait five minutes, and then you skin, and then you have all of your plastics clean. So that's the main differences. And the API only has for PE, PP, and PT, and you might ask what you did for PS, or what you use for LDP. So for polystyrene, I use the PT, and for LDP, I use the PPP. Uh, style. After washing all of that, those plastics, because I had like from one to seven, the one and two I didn't want, uh, we got the clean flakes after the washing. We did, so these are the, I forgot to mention, these are the flakes you get after washing. So this is number two HDP from Murph One Davenport. If, later, if you want to take a look at that, this is like LDP from Murph One Two. This is polystyrene, so you can see a lot of reds from those cups, Murph 1. And then after getting the flakes, we extruded and we get pellets. So like more uniform uh, plastic. And these plastics, after extruding it, we use an 18 millimeter twin screw co-rotating uh, extruder we get the pellets to do the characterization, but we want also wanted some dog bones for mechanical testing. So we have an uh, injection molder, and we did some injection to get like ASTM type one dog bones. So these are like the standard types of dog bones. The ASTM has like type one, two, three, four, five for mechanical testing, the tensile testing, but we can also get like for impact strength, uh, testing uh, for DMA, TMA testing, so other characterization tests that we can use the injection molder to get some uh, samples. And after getting all of this, my, my research, doing all of this characterization work, I don't know how much of, are you familiar with all of this soup of letters, but uh, some are like basic, um, uh, tests like the melt flow rate. It's an easy uh, test to do. You just load your pellets uh, in the barrel here. You, there's a specific ASTM standard to follow. Uh, you're just gonna melt that plastic and then you make cuts with a razor blade and then you check the mass of that and it uh, gives you the MFR or the MFI, the melt flow index. Uh, and that's uh, a property that is re related with viscosity, so it's really important for processing uh, of that material. The others, there are like thermal properties that we analyze, some molecular properties, uh, what else? We looked for metals, because for food packaging, it's really important that uh, we, we don't want lead, cadmium, or chromium into our plastics, so we check for that too. Uh, I didn't add here, but we run also GPC, gel permeation chromatography, to check molecular weight. So uh, there's a lot of tests 
that can be done. I finished collecting all of this data like last month. No, September. No, it was last month. Yes, last month. So you imagine that I didn't show here. There's a lot of graphs, a lot of data, all of this. But that's just a part of, a small part of my research. And thank you. Sorry if I, I went over one minute. But uh, if you have any questions, uh, and if you have any questions about a MRF, I have all of these slides. If, you wanna, if anyone is interested, I can share those slides too. Thank you. Do you have any issues with contamination for your site of PET? Uh, I think for like water bottles, soda bottles, the labels, they come pretty easily once we do the, the grinding step and the washing because PT is higher than, the, the density is higher than one, and the labels are usually made of polyethylene or polypropylene, so they, they float, so they, it's easy to separate. So what's a problem is when you have labels that are like uh, glue uh, to, the, to the bottle, for example, and there, there, I saw a video this week uh, from the APR, and they're like pushing uh, like the plastic, packaging manufacturers to move to a design, to a packaging design where the label can come off easily. You know. It's a big, uh, like this size tall, this size, and this is a small one, we have a bigger one uh, that's uh, coupled to an elutriation tower. So we never had problems with PT but it depends on the size. If you have a smaller grinder, you're probably gonna wanna... Our grinders. Yeah, you, I think you're gonna have to cut it with a scissor before, so to help it, because sometimes smaller uh, grinders, you won't have the, the power to, to do all of that. No, from Davenport, uh, we got these three to seven plastic bills and we did the sort. Then we have like plastic bags with just number one, plastic bags with just number two, and then we got all plastic bags with that. Each bale, 600 hours of like main hours, let's put it. Hours? Yeah. Where did you get those main hours? Uh, undergrads. <laughs> 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 and, but they're, they're, getting, they're getting paid like per hour, so. It's, it's a job. I know that's not the most attractive job that, that you find. And with, more recently, we work on a bay with like, it was the reject of the MRF. So we got it from Davenport. So there's a lot of organic and the plastic films. We're interested in the plastic films. And that was very disgusting. This three to seven was clean. It's just some yogurt dripping, but <laughs> uh, the other one had like a chicken leg or some other stuff. So yeah, diapers. <laughs> so that's a good question. We put in the sink. <laughs> um, we, of course, there's sodium hydroxide. When we have to, we check for the pH before we neutralize it if it's uh, too alkaline. Uh, the Triton X is like a detergent, we just uh, dilute it with more water. Uh, so it's close to like dish, dishwashing soap, so. And yeah, uh, in the real world, like companies do this kind of washing. They have like big tanks where they move this water to these decanting tanks. So they remove everything, all the dirty, all the, waste that is in the water, they decant that, they remove and they filter that water and use it again. We don't have this all this filter capability because we're doing batches, but in real world they reuse that water because it's a lot of water. I think it will increase because uh, there's a lot of plastics that is not being recycled uh, polypropylene uh, will get will start to be recycled uh, as PET and HDP because there is a lot of market for polypropylene. There's a lot of laws in California, Washington that are requiring an amount of recycled plastics into packaging, 
and the plastic, uh, the packaging manufacturers, they, they're not finding sources like feedstock of recycled polypropylene. So I think the MRFs will have to adapt to start recycling more polypropylene to have like polypropylene bales. And I, I think for plastic films, it's gonna take a little bit more time to get to, for mechanical recycling. There are some other alternatives that are being studied like chemical recycling. Uh, for example, multi-layer films. How do you recycle multi-layer films? Uh, I didn't show here, but I do. It's also part of this DOE project. Uh, we do a solvent target and precipitation method to recycle multi-layer films. Uh, they're they're trying to scale up a system where you where you use different solvents to target each layer of your plastics, and then you dissolve one layer. Uh, remove that and precipitate it to recover as a solid and then you repeat it with a different solvent uh, ha how many times are needed sometimes of these films they can have seven nine layers of different plastics so it's a lot challenging but uh, it will take a lot of time and like this we call strap a solvent target recovery and precipitation um, it's really great for like post-industrial waste because here we think, oh, waste, municipal solid waste, but a lot of companies they, that manufacture in this packaging, they have a lot of waste uh, that is technically clean, you know, just like rolls that can be used to, to make packaging, but they're plastic and they, I don't know if I can say, but there's a company here uh, close to Ames, they manufacture packaging and they have a lot of waste and they sent their waste here to Ames. Their Ames has a, they call a resource recovery facility and they burn some of that plastic, some of the material they receive to generate energy for the city. And they currently are sending some of their post, we call post-industrial plastic waste to be burned. So it's better than going to a landfill, but it's not the ideal in terms of uh, amount of money you can get from the plastic. So. So these like these new technologies are easier to do when you f with post-industrial waste because it's a cleaner stream. Yeah, for some properties, it's kind of hard to compare with virgin because even virgin uh, plastics they have like a range of uh, properties. But one thing that we notice, like there's obviously some degradation in terms of molecular weight. Uh, you can see some degradation on the I, I, I'm probably going with a lot of details here but on the carbonyl area using FTIR carbonyl it's like a CWO that you're starting to get is as a degradation compound um, yellowing of the material uh, with re recycling like if you didn't clean well like removed contaminants you can get like some yellowing with the material. Uh, viscosity, you have some reduction in viscosity that's associated with molecular weight. But uh, I didn't see a lot of degradation. So, and because uh, a lot of these are like, they're produced from virgin. So we're like, it's one cycle of, re of recycling. Uh, once we started to have more uh, recycled content into this packaging, uh, we're probably going to see more degradation because that recycling will start to build up and that degradation will start to carry out with, the, with time. But it will take a lot of time till we get to that point. Great, so that's thank you.